Well, welcome. Thank you. Somebody asked me a minute ago if I was conflicted or not. They said, you seem to be a Hawaiian cowboy. <laughs> uh, uh, I just like Hawaiian shoots, shirts, and uh, I've always worn cowboy outfits, so I guess I am. Uh, you know, I've, today we're going to be studying, as we go verse by verse, we're going to be in the ninth chapter of Acts, starting with the first verse. It's one of my favorite sections of scripture because it talks about Saul, who later becomes Paul. And it starts out and it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. You know, up to this point, we know a little bit about Saul. We saw his name first in Acts 7, 58, when it says, uh, when Stephen was dragged out of the city to stone him, it says, Meanwhile, witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Then again, when Stephen was put to death, it says in Acts 8, 1, And Saul was there, giving approval to his death. You know, the Apostle Paul himself later on in a prayer said this much later in his life in Acts 22, 20. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. In fact, if you read Acts chapter 22, Paul gives a complete story of his conversion that we're going to be looking at today. Paul often gives his testimony. You know, he's not afraid to share who he was and who he is now. Uh, I believe it gives us strength to know just how far we have come in our walk with Christ. I think we should share our testimony periodically. It's something that I enjoy doing. You know, our testimony is a lesson for others that they too can come to a life changing decision by accepting Jesus Christ. You know, in Philippians, the third chapter, the first nine verses, we have one of those instances where Paul gives his testimony. And he says this, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, whose glory, whose glory is in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting his church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. For whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. That's a powerful testimony, isn't it? It's a powerful statement. You know, in his testimony, you can see where Saul was before the encounter with Christ Jesus. And, he, and who he became after his encounter. As we continue on with this Acts chapter 9, we're going to pick up with the first verse. So if you're following along, pick up at the first verse of the ninth chapter. It says, He went to the high priest, the last part of it, and he asked for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. Remember, Saul was a Pharisee. Saul was going to seek out and and persecute those who belong to the way because they were teaching something that he didn't believe in at the time. They were teaching that the Messiah had come and he had doubts and he had fears and he wasn't accepting that. 
And he was going to seek out anybody who was party to the way. It says, Damascus was the nearest city outside of the Holy Land. It had a large Jewish population. It was about 150 miles from Jerusalem. It was a four to six day journey. It was no small task that Saul was going to take when he was going to go into Damascus to round up those who belonged to the way. He was dedicated. He was motivated. He had fire in his eyes and hatred in his heart. All the time thinking that he was doing right. Saul's mission now was found in the second verse. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. The way. The way was used for Christianity. It probably came from a verse that we all know, John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The term the way is used for Christianity many times in Acts. It's found in the 16th chapter, the 18th chapter, the 19th chapter, the 22nd chapter, and the 24th chapter. So people of Christianity identified themselves with Jesus' statement. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's a statement you and I need to commit to memory and be willing to say that anytime, any place, anywhere. Scripture goes on in the third verse. As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You know, sometimes you just need to get knocked down to listen, don't you? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just get, need to get knocked off our feet to listen to what God is trying to tell us. It's not the best way to do it, but it's often in our testimony. That's my testimony. I was knocked off my pedestal, and I realized I needed somebody. Well, Saul says, well, who are you? And I like this next part because in the Greek, he's talking about somebody that's lording over him. He says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He knew that he was dealing with someone powerful here, didn't he? He had been knocked down. He had been literally knocked down on the road. And Saul so asked. And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Well, I, I, I love that statement. Who was Saul persecuting? The way, right? He's dragging men and women and putting them into prison if he can. He had Stephen put to death and yet He's knocked down by this voice that's there, this thundering voice that nobody else, they heard the noise, but nobody else heard the words. And he's knocked down and he said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. If you persecute the church, who are you persecuting? Jesus Christ, aren't you? We stand because of him. Well, we're told in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. In Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Yeah, I want to say it again. To persecute the church is to persecute Christ. Well, it says the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. 
For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Can you imagine that? He's knocked down, and he gets up, and he's blind. This guy who was going into Damascus with literally a group of soldiers to round up people that belonged to the way, and he was leading them. Now he's knocked to the ground, and who's leading him into town? Somebody else by the hand. Talk about humiliating. Talk about something I'm sure he didn't count on. You know, he didn't eat or he didn't drink anything. You know, he was blind. I'm afraid that sometimes that is exactly how we are. He was desperate. He was blind. He was confused. He was fasting and he's praying for three days. In our fast moving world today, that's a lifetime. You know, it must have seemed like one for Saul as well. He was confused. He was broken. He was scared. He didn't know what to do. He had been accused of persecuting Jesus. Maybe now he was thinking about Stephen's sermon that he had to have heard when he was standing there. He must have been flooded with feelings of guilt, but he still did not understand. You know, wasn't he doing God's work? Or had it all been really just to protect what he had been raised with? His Hebrew heritage, his religion, his way of life. Had he missed something there? It's like a person in a biblical discussion that says, I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I believe. A lot of people believe that, don't they? A lot of people will stand that way. You know, I had a, a very good friend, a Catholic priest, and I were studying Greek together. I was teaching him to read from the scriptures in the Greek. And he took off his glasses and he said to me, you see this? And I said, yeah, yeah, I see that. He said, this is my lens of tradition. He said, I read the Bible through my lens of tradition. Mm. You and I need to be careful that we read the Bible for what it says rather than for what we want it to say. Amen. You know, it, all that, you know, a Pharisee, his way of life, his actions that led to the death of Stephen, had it all been wrong? If that was so, was his being knocked to the ground and blinded his punishment? You know, how many unanswered questions he must have dealt with in those three days. How many times he must have looked at himself and not understood exactly what was going on. You know, I can tell you that help can come from many directions. You know, when we're searching for answers, you need to be open to see where the answers will be provided from. But I have learned over the years that the answers can come from places you often least expect them to. Sometimes the answers are so much simpler than the question we really have. In my early ministry, when I was in seminary, I think I've shared some of this before, I was, I was given a task in Bible college, and my task was to go to a nursing home and preach in the nursing home. And um, that was an interesting experience. I took Pat, and at that time our boys were just, just old enough and they became my deacons. They would pass communion to the people in the nursing home and often somebody would grab the trays. And I remember one time my oldest son said, boy, this is tough work, Papa. <laughs> this is tough. And yet in that nursing home I learned one of the greatest lessons ever, ever. Because there was a lady that was totally paralyzed. Her name was Margaret. And one day I was preaching in there and one of the attendants came over and said, Margaret wants to see you. And I said, who is Margaret? And they said, well, she's in room, and I can't remember the room number, but say room 416. 
And I went and I saw Margaret and the only thing she could move was her mouth. And she said, I've heard about you. I think you need help. She was right, I did. Uh, I was learning and she said, I, like I have for so many other young ministers, I am going to be your prayer warrior. And I said, my what? And she said, you're in a battle, don't you know that? And I said, uh, well, 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 wait a minute, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm out of the military now, I'm just preaching a sermon. And she said, you're in a battle and you need a prayer warrior. Oh, well, she was much more than that. She became a confidant. She became somebody that knew my little secrets. And she prayed for us, didn't she, Pat? Pat's got tears in her eyes. It's going to make me get tears, too, because Margaret was somebody that was special. And she prayed for me for the next 20 years. And when I got news that Margaret was gone, I told Pat, I've lost my prayer warrior. I wrote her for years, cards, and even though I moved all kinds of different places and became pastor of different churches, I would send her my prayer requests on a monthly basis, and she was my warrior. But she found somebody to write me back, and she would give me advice, and she would say, remember when? Because I was writing now, well, the church is really growing, and this is happening. And she would say, remember when? Remember when you were confused? Remember when this happened? Remember that? I don't think Paul ever forgot, do you? Well, here's Paul. He's in Damascus. He's confused. He's blind. He's waiting. But there was also a man in Damascus, a disciple, called Ananias. The Lord called to Ananias in a vision. And Ananias properly said, yes, Lord. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Wow. God called out to Ananias in a vision. Ananias is having contact with Jesus Christ. In those first verses, Ananias is told where to go, who to see, what Saul is even doing, and that Saul knows that he is coming and that through him, Saul is going to receive his sight. Boy, that's powerful, isn't it? I sure wish God would do that to me often. I wish he'd say, this is where you're gonna go, this is the date you're gonna be there, this is what's gonna happen. <sighs> well, we don't know much about Ananias, he's a disciple. In those verses, there is no sign of alarm from Ananias. So he must be a praying man, a spiritual man, and one who Jesus can call to take on one of the most important tasks ever in the church. But there's a problem. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. An excuse. Do you have excuses that you give God? I'm too busy today. Or, or I'm not sure they're home. Or when Pat and I started churches, that was my excuse. You know, Pat will go out and greet and talk to anybody in the world, and you have to push me and push me and push me to get me to do that. So we'd drive up to a house, and if they had one car there, I would say, you know, obviously, they're a two-car family. Nobody's home, Pat. We need to go on to the next place. And Pat would say, who are you kidding? <laughs> we need to call on this house. 
And I can't tell you how many times the door opened and great things took place because of that. But Ananias said, wow, I've heard about this guy. It would seem to me that he should just go and we should leave him alone. That's a wow moment that takes place. Something others would just give about everything to happen to them that happened to Ananias. But Ananias tells Jesus, do you know what you're asking me to do? This guy is dangerous. But the Lord said to Ananias, and if you look at this word in the Greek, it's an imperative. Go. That's the word. Go. This man is my chosen instrument. I like that. Not a person. He's my chosen what? Instrument. To carry my name before the Gentiles and their kinds and before the people of Israel. And then he says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul later wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 30, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk this way. I am more. I have worked harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily pressure of my concern from all the churches. Who is weak? I do not feel weak. Who is led to sin? I do not inwardly burn. I must, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Now that's suffering for Christ. That's suffering. What did, what did God say to Ananias? I'm going to show him how much he will suffer for my name. If I had known that, I probably wouldn't have gone into the ministry. <laughs> Do we suffer? <coughs> yes, we have. And we usually suffer because of our weakness, don't we? You know, I have, I have come close to death twice because of my weakness. Rather than trust in God, I internalized and my colon exploded. Uh, I learned a lot. You know, I think sometimes we forget that when God calls us, he's going to use us no matter what, in strength and in weakness. You know, as I thought about these scriptures this week, I thought, what can I, what can I leave with the congregation? Well, the first thing I thought is, the impossible is possible with God. Amen. You know, the impossible is not a word that we Christian Jews, is it? The impossible is possible with God. Scripture even talks about that, doesn't it? It says, with God, nothing is impossible. You know, I joked about this, but Pat and I spent 30 years starting new churches. We started six churches. And the way we would start a church is they would move us to a community where there was not a church. And we'd have to go door to door to meet people to start the initial core of people within the church. Every morning I got up and threw up till I couldn't throw up anymore before we would go door to door six times, six different times they did it. In our weakness, sometimes God uses us the greatest way possible, doesn't he? In our weakness, 
he can use that. I know that's a weakness I have. That's why I married Pat. <laughs> because she'll talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime. And that's a, that's a great thing because Pat and I are a team in Christ. When you got me, you got lucky. You got Pat. That gives us strength, doesn't it? In my weakness, you know, I've been able to help a lot of young ministers because of my weakness. Because it's only through Christ that we were able to get things done. So I would say, number one, the impossible is possible with God. When I became a Christian, there was no intent on my part to ever be a minister. Not at all. In fact, I just wanted to sit there and not do anything. And in Chandler, when I got stationed at Williams Air Force Base, we started going to church and they asked me to be the junior high teacher. They do that to everybody. Anybody who's gullible, you become the junior high teacher. And so I'm teaching the junior high youth group and I was so unorthodox that that group began to grow. And the church said, our youth minister is leaving. We would like you to be our youth minister. And I said, oh no. <laughs> I'm in college at Mesa Community College. My plan is to get my AA degree and move on to ASU. And, and they said, oh, that's even better. You'll be here for a while. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> and I turned it down and turned it down and turned it down. And finally, they wore me down. And I said, OK, as long as that's all I do. <laughs> And I've told you this before, but the first week I was youth minister, the senior minister, Lynn Dietz, had a heart attack. And the elders came to me and said, it's our custom that when the senior minister can't be in the pulpit, the youth minister is. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. <laughs> Can I change my opinion here? And they said, oh, no, you're going to do it. It, honest truth, Pat wrote my very first sermon. Pat used to teach me the lesson that I would teach the junior high kids because I grew up not in the church. I didn't know that there was a New Testament and an Old Testament. I grew up without that upbringing. So Pat wrote my first sermon out of the book of James, and I paid for that later on because I am preaching in church, and it's like here, and there was a fan right over the pulpit. And it blew my pages shut. And out of my mouth came a profanity. I was brand new. I'm just learning Christianity, and, and I didn't even realize I did that. I finally found the page again. And maybe 10 minutes later, or probably five minutes later, because my whole sermon probably lasted 12 minutes. But after, after about five minutes, it did it again, and out of my mouth came another one. Uh, I was learning. After the, the message, I'm standing at the back of the church, as ministers do. And as people came out, they could have destroyed me. People could have said, I heard what you said up there. You're never going to be in the pulpit ever again. But as people came out, they said things like, well, we think you're a diamond in the rough. Uh, we think you have some potential. Uh, well, they had to put up with me for six more weeks in the pulpit. And, and a young man came forward to accept Christ. I think he figured, gosh, if this guy could be preaching, <laughs> anybody can come forward. And I baptized him. I really didn't understand exactly. And the, the joke is true. As I lowered him in the water, I had put on the minister's waders. And as I lowered him in the water, the water rose and filled my waders. <laughs> It's a miracle I stayed in the ministry. 
because I didn't know what to do, but I thought, okay, I'll say a prayer. Said a prayer, shut the curtains, took the straps off, fell out of the baptistry. I'm sopping wet and I run to the back of the church. And I said to Pat, do you think anybody will know that, uh, she said, there's a puddle of water, Wally. <laughs> With God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Saul persecuted the church. He persecuted the way. Jesus said, I am whom you are persecuting. His reputation brought fear around those. He participated in a murder, and yet God chose him to carry the gospel to the world. Nothing is impossible with God. Well, second, your call, as simple as it sounds, may change the world around you. I believe that God calls each and every one of you to a task. Sometimes we never find out what that task is. But I believe he calls each of us to a task. That requires that we live for him, though. That requires that you know, that we share our testimony. That requires that we let people know that we are not perfect, but we are forgiven in Christ Jesus. That's the greatest testimony we have, isn't it? I, my greatest testimony is when somebody criticizes me for something I've done, I can say, well, boy, I'm sure glad I have Jesus because he forgave me. And last, trust Trust that nothing is impossible for you with God at your side. Trust it over and over and over again. You know, I, I had a call this week from somebody that, that uh, I worked with. I, I took, spent 40 years in the ministry and then I took a 15 year break. Uh, in the 15 years that I took a break in the ministry, God healed some things he needed to heal. I had a very bad experience in church, and I was very angry, very hurt, and very mad at God. We had a point that Pat called Wally's Point on our property. We lived on a mountain in South Dakota, and we lived isolated. We lived in a solar and wind-powered house, and we were off the grid. And we were four miles from any civilization whatsoever. It allowed me to heal. And I would go out on Wally Point, and I would yell at God. God, I've given you my life. How could this happen to me? Well, God provided for me a ministry, but a ministry working in the Department of Corrections, ministry working with kids. I went back and I got my master's degree in psychology and the, the state of South Dakota hired me to write juvenile corrections in South Dakota. I found my zeal and my excitement about Christ again as I served in that capacity. I can't tell you how many kids I told about Jesus Christ. The governor called me the minister for the Department of Corrections. He would have me pray at all kinds of events. He even sent me during campaign time to preach in churches and say that the governor sent me. Uh, and he restored my soul. He restored who I was. And I'm here today because nothing is impossible with God. And you're my prayer warriors today. A lot of people have said to me, I'm praying for you. You're my prayer warriors. And I'm yours. That can tell you every single morning, I get up and I have a directory that I've added a bunch of names on. And I pray for every single person in this church. Sometimes I don't know what to pray for. But I just pray that God will open a door or bless or heal you.
Nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? Amen. You know, we're going to be singing our invitation hymn in a second. And if you haven't accepted Christ, it's going to be a time to come forward and do that. If you want to become part of this wonderful fellowship, I'm excited that we're growing and God is doing great things here. If you want to be part of that as we sing our invitation, it'll be time to come forward. Will you stand with me and then I'm going to say our prayer and then we're going to have our, our invitation hymn. Father, we thank you for this time we can gather together and Father, that we can see the miracle of Saul who becomes Paul, who wrote for us the guidance found throughout the New Testament. Father, we know that nothing is impossible with you.